Greetings hobbyists, this is Arsans of Vool, and in this video we're going to be looking at how to make a node collection where you can make roofs and it's automatically going to work everything out by the sizes, you can change the amount of tiles you've got in the x direction, in the y direction, you can change the angle of the tiles, you can change the gap between the tiles and what's really cool about this is that it allows this to work between different tile collections because it's automatically calculating everything based on the size. So if I go to a smaller set of tiles, for example these, and just select that, you'll see it instantly makes those tiles and I can do exactly the same thing and it's automatically calculated everything or I can just go back to my other tile collection and it swaps out really quickly and easily, automatically calculating all of the values based on those tile sizes. And before we go any further, it is coming up to the channel's first birthday, which will be on the 10th of December. You might be watching this after that, but either way, it'd be really appreciated if you could give this video a like and potentially subscribe if you're not subscribed already. I'd love to get to nine or even 10,000 subscribers before the first birthday. I wasn't expecting anywhere close to that when I started the channel. So thank you very much, guys, for your support. It's been hugely appreciated, and I hope you enjoy the video. So first of all, we need to have our default cube. To be fair, any object at all, if it's going to be a geometry node and that's going to be in a separate collection to some tiles so I've got some test tiles here and we've got this idea of there being various different tiles that we want to make up our roof now there are some things that are going to be important about this at least initially but you should have all of these tiles in one collection for this to work and the tiles should be the same size or at least approximately so but I mean in this instance they are all exactly the same size and that's going to give you a better result and finally you should have them with all having the origins at the same point so for example if we look at all of these all of their origins are on the back lower edge in the center now you could do this anywhere on the back edge and I do think that gives the best result when we start rotating things but it could be for example either of the back corners I just chose the center of the back edge just because it's probably a little bit easier to work things out in my head now importantly once you've done that you do need to for all of them press ctrl and a and apply the rotation and scale otherwise you're going to have some problems later on you could do this later on but it's just something I'd start off with so let's start with the geometry nodes. Drag your geometry node editor up. If you don't have that, it's because you've probably got a timeline here, just click there and go to geometry node editor, select the cube, click new, and we've got our geometry nodes. We don't need this group input for now. I'm gonna put that off to the side. We are gonna come back to this later, so it is important that we've got it. But what we want is something that we're gonna instance these along. So I'm gonna press shift and A, and we're gonna bring in a mesh line. Now, you could do this with a curve line, but it makes life harder. So I'd suggest you do it with the mesh line and shift alt and left click to connect that to the group output. That's using an add-on called Node Wrangler. It comes with Blender. You just need to go to Edit, Preferences, Add-ons, and then Activate Node Wrangler. Now, at the moment, this mesh line is going, well, vertically because it's going in the Z axis. We don't want that. We want it going in the X axis. So I'm just going to put something like 10 for that. And you can see here that this has got a count of 10. I can up that. And all that is is the amount of vertices and each vertex is offset by that amount. So we've got six at the moment offset by 10. And if I just come over here and click apply all and go to vertex, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, and each one is 10, whatever units you're using apart. Let's just undo that. So we're back to our mesh line and we want to instance our tiles onto those points. Now this is where things are going to get a little bit tricky and we're going to have to convince Blender to do some things that it normally wouldn't do. Let's start with the basics of instancing these. I have covered this in previous videos but we'll go through that. So shift A I want to instance on points. I'm going to go there and importantly I want to instance this collection onto it. So I'm just going to come to my test tiles, drag that in so I've got a collection info node. Importantly, we're going to need to separate children and reset children and then grab that into the instances. And you'll notice we've got loads of things that seem to be having a problem. And the reason for that is because at the moment for each vertex, there is one copy of every single one of these tiles, all of them. So they're overlapping. So what we want to do is click pick instance and now there's only one of each. They're still overlapping a bit, but that's just because my line isn't long enough. If I change the offset, you can see what we're doing here. Whereas if we didn't have that pick instance, there's still lots of them on top of each other. So that pick instance being selected is quite important, but we're going to do something clever with this later in another place. So it's important you know what that is. 
We can also, at this point, randomize the scale or the rotation of these slightly. Now, I generally don't like to randomize the rotation very much. Some people do. I just don't think it looks very like what tiles are, but we can randomize the scale. So all we're gonna want is a random value. We want that to be a float. So effectively anything between, let's say zero and one at this point, and we're going to want to plug that into our scale, but this is a value and that's a vector. So this doesn't go together very well. What we need to do is come here and use a combine X, Y, and Z. So I'm gonna put that there and it's automatically on the X. We actually, or I want to randomize this just in terms of its length down the roof. So we actually want to select that into the Y. So we'll go with there. And then we should be able to connect this to our scale everything disappears because we don't want these being zero, we want them being one. So let's put that as one. So at the moment, this is randomizing these between zero and one, with one being 100%. And we don't want them smaller, I think I want a few of them larger. So what I'm gonna do is put that to 1.1, and then I'm gonna put that to one. So we've only got a little bit of variation, actually we might put that up 1.2, something like that. So they're a little bit more varied in their size. That should look okay. In fact, let's put that to 0 0.9, so some are a little bit shorter. Anyway, you can fiddle around with that, but importantly, we've got this random value going into our scale for this instance. And obviously we can just up the count to have more or less. So we'll start manipulating that later. So just to clear things up, what I'm gonna do is just drag these around just like that. And I'm gonna select all these and using Node Wrangler, I'm gonna press Shift and P to put a little box around those so we know what this is. I'm gonna press F2 to name it, and I'm just gonna call this tile instances, because that's what it is. So nice and easy to see. Let's move that over to the side. So this just makes everything a little bit easier to move around and see what we're doing there. Now, importantly, we're gonna to want to be able to select this, as I did at the beginning, without having to come into the geometry nodes. So we can do this with our group input. So I'm actually gonna add this in here. And you can see as I dragged it in, it's now part of this group. And what I want to do is connect this where it's got our input here to our group input. And now you can see on the right hand side, it's got that as a choice. So I can just do this over here. Now, what we don't need is the geometry. So I'm gonna to come to this group and I'm just gonna select geometry and I'm going to delete it. And at this point, we've got everything sorted. You could also put these random values into the group input, but I'm probably just gonna leave that. That's not something I'm gonna fiddle around with each time. Now we need to make more tiles of these going down our roof. So we need more of these repeated in the y-axis. And what we're effectively gonna do is actually just create more of this mesh line in what's gonna effectively be a grid. So I'm gonna press Shift and A, and I'm going to bring in another mesh line just here. Now we can't see that, so actually let's just shift and alt and we'll bring that in so we can just see that. And we can see this mesh line just here. So we want this on the y-axis, so let's change this from z to zero and the y to let's say 10 again. Oh no, it needs to be minus 10 because we want it coming the other way. And I'm just gonna press G to move that slightly off the origin so it's easier to see. Now at this point we need our original mesh line to be on each of the vertices of this mesh line. So again, we're just gonna use an instance on points. So instance on points, put that in there, and we want to instance this line. So I'm gonna disconnect this for now, now that we know that part works, and mesh line into instances, and you can see we've got lots of copies of our line. And if we actually just drag that into here, let's get rid of that and put that there, we now have lots of copies of our tiles. Great, that's exactly what we wanted to happen. Now you might have spotted an issue here, I'll come back to that later, but let's fix this first. So the first thing we want to do is we want to have our offset. We don't like the look of this, it doesn't look quite right because well, tiles have this nice brick pattern. Now I have done a video on this recently, there's a link in the top right hand corner where I'm gonna go into this in a bit more detail, but what we need to do is fiddle with our line that's going in the Y axis because we don't want this going effectively straight down with each one of these points, a point there, point there, point there, point there being copied. We need to have this in a zigzag doing that. So it's gonna offset each of the points. So how do we add in that zigzag? Well, if you followed that video, you'll know that what we need to do is select certain of these vertices and move them across. So to do that, we shift an A and we need to use a set position node, just plug that in there. 
And what this allows us to do is to move everything on the x-axis a certain amount. So let's say something like that. But we don't want everything to move. We only want certain vertices to move. And to do that, we use an index. So Shift and A, index. Again, this is described in much more detail in that video, so I don't want to go through everything twice in case people have already watched that video. You can use that link that is in the description to go through that. We need to tell this to look at the index, but we only want every other one. So we're going to use what's called a modulo function, which is a type of math function. And effectively, it says divide each index value. So you've got zero at the top, then one, then two, then three. Divide that by a value here. And if there is a remainder, well, do something in this instance. So we're going to put two because we want every other one. Put that value into the selection. And you'll notice that we've got now our zero and our two and our four, all staying where they were, only moving one, three, basically anything that doesn't divide by two. So that's got that sorted now. Now at this point, we're basically done. We've got the basic setup here. We are gonna to want to rotate things around slightly. So for example, we are gonna to want to be able to control the rotation here on the X so that we've got the tiles can overlap a little bit. Again, I'll deal with that in a bit. So I'm gonna put that back to zero. We also want to deal with the position of where all the tiles are and make this so it works automatically, which is the complicated bit, admittedly. Now, at this point, we're probably noticing a problem. Everything that's the first one is all the same tile. And the next one is all the second tile. So we've got first tile there, our second tile there. And that's because our instancing is not being random over here. So we do need to deal with that. So let's randomize these first of all. Probably should have done that earlier. So I apologize if that's causing any confusion. So I'm just gonna move these down and we're gonna go with our instance index. And that effectively is what are you picking? And we just want to have a random value here. So I'm gonna pick random value, put that there and this will start randomizing which ones we've got. Now at the moment it says a minimum of zero and a maximum of 100. Well, there aren't 100 tiles here. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So we want this to be 13. And you'll notice now on this top row that it's not in the order that it was. So we've actually got well, one of these boring ones first. Then we've got this one, which is uh, there next so it's randomized the values but there's still a problem what it's doing is the first one in each row is exactly the same and then the second one in each row is exactly the same and then the third one in each row is exactly the same and that's because what it's doing is it's instancing the first row each time so we can tell it not to do that all we need to do is add in here a realize instance node and what this node is doing is say no 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 don't copy each of the lines. I want you to make each of the vertices be a real thing, then instance the vertices so that now everything's random. So that realize instances is very important. So let's get on with the tricky bit now. And admittedly, this is the bit that took me the time to work out. And that is that we want everything to be controlled by the size of the tiles. We don't want to have to put in these values. Otherwise, this isn't very automatic. Sorry about the quick jump there. I'm a little bit ill at the moment and I went to get a glass of water and came back to find my laptop had run out of batteries. So I've just had to rebuild a bit of this. Uh, it should be exactly the same as I just followed my own video to make sure everything's in exactly the same place. So what we're going to do is we need to set this up so that we've got the distance apart. So the offset of this and then the offset of our mesh line here. And then finally our offset of our set position all controlled by the size of our tiles because otherwise well what's the point we've got to do everything manually and while that's not going to be the worst if this is all set up it's at least going to be a bit of a pain so we have covered that previously i'm not going to go into a lot of description of how this works but all we need to do is pick an object i'm just going to grab one of these cubes we will deal with this later again but we're just using one of them as an example what we need to do is turn this into a bounding box so that we've got our minimum and maximum. Do some vector maths here where we're going to subtract the minimum from the maximum. That's how we make a range or a size. And then we're going to turn this vector into a separate X, Y, and Z there so we can just get individual bits of this. So this is working at this point 
and what we're going to do is deal with our offset. So at the moment we've got an offset here on the y-axis. Let's make this so that actually it's going to be something to do with the size of our tiles. So we need to put the y into here except for this is as a vector and we can't put individual ones in so I'm just going to use a combine x, y and z there. You'll notice as soon as we do this, this then breaks everything. It looks horrible. And we're going to put the Y into the Y. And at the moment, it's going the thickness of one of our tiles. Notice there's still a bit of overlap here because we've got our scaling going on. If I actually just get rid of that, you'll notice this is perfectly the right size. So at this point that's working, except we don't want this being a whole tile. We only want this going half this distance. So just going to bring in a math node. Put that in there and we're just going to divide by two so now we've got a nice little bit of overlap there so that when we angle these it's going to look a little bit better in fact let's deal with the angling now again this will be something that we're going to fiddle around with so we want all of our tile instances to be rotated on the x-axis so something like there okay with a little bit of overlap still there but you can see what this is going to look like just like a roof now we've done this once but we need to do this again in the X direction. So let's grab those. And we need to do that for this mesh line along the X. So Shift and D there, except for we want this connected to the X. Connect that there. And we don't want that divided. And we want it in the X. Oh, for some reason, I seem to have changed that off of subtract. Don't know how I did that. So there we go. We've got that working. But again, we don't want our tiles perfectly touching. That looks a bit rubbish. So let's G and move that along. And what I'm going to do is add some maths in here. So we're going to do an add. Move that along a bit. And that's going into our X. So now we can add an amount. For example, I want something like 0 0.8 millimeters. And we've got that gap. And you can see where we're going with this. It's starting to look really good in terms of our tiles. Now we've got that going, I'm going to add this to the scaling again. So we've got, again, a little bit more variation. You can see where this is going to look really nice when you've got these slightly different sized tiles. Maybe I've got a few more broken ones than I need. But what's great about this is I can just shift and D. And now I've got another one. And then there, and then there, and then there. And this is adding this to our test tiles every time. So now we're going to get more of the ones that aren't broken. So we can fiddle around with this every time. But this brings us to a slight problem with this. Uh, which we'll deal with now, in that now that I've done that, this isn't actually randomizing it very well because our random value here is now at 13. It's still not adding these extra random tiles, so this isn't working very well. So what we want this to do is have still a minimum value of zero, but we want a maximum value that's going to be, well, essentially the number of tiles in this collection. Now, we can do this. All we're going to have to do is deal with this max value. So we're going to ask it to count how many tiles are in this collection. So all we do is bring in a collection info node. Let's put that there and then drag this out to the side because it's going to be part of it. We need to count this separately. We're going to select our test tiles and then we need to say to count it, for which we use the domain size. So domain size of geometry and we want the number of instances. And we're just going to put that instance count into there and now However many we add to this, it's automatically going to put that maximum as the number that there are. So now we don't have to fiddle around with that. It's already done for us. Brilliant. Now at this point, we want to start neatening this up. And we're going to make this so that everything works over here. Because at the moment, we've, we've got this going. It's fine. We can deal with everything. But we have got one problem. And to be fair, it's not the biggest problem. It's this object info node. Don't like this. For this to work over here, what we're going to need to do is make a group input. So, and we're going to have to connect this up to our group input, which is fine, except for then when we come here, we're going to select the collection and then we have to select one of the objects in the collection. And eh, I just don't like that. It's not very elegant. So, we're actually going to get rid of this object info here and this object info here. And we're going to replace it with effectively saying, look at the size of the objects in this collection and use that. Now, to do that, we sort of have to trick Blender a little bit. So what we're going to be doing is using this collection. We're going to ignore all this for now. I'm just going to go and forget all of this and just worry about getting all the collection in one place to look at it. So let's do that here. So the first thing we need to do is trick Blender 
to well look at one of these in fact actually what we're going to do is look at all of these to do that i'm going to once again make a mesh line because all i want is actually one vertex so i'm just going to put that down to one and at this point everything else is irrelevant so i'm just going to make that a little bit smaller and then i need to put an instance on this single vertices so instance on points then we need to tell it to have a look for our collection so let's bring in a collection info node and then we select our group input to be our collection so now if i press shift and alt this will work except for it's in the wrong place we need to do that and once again we've got this problem that all of them are on top of each other which normally we fix by selecting pick instance except for this time we're not going to do that and this is where this is going to be a little bit clever. So what we're going to do here is just like our information here, we're going to create a bounding box so we can have a look at the size of our whole collection. But what's cool about this is that because this is a bounding box, oh, I should say we're getting this horrible thing here. So I need to realize instances, plug that in there. We've now got a bounding box that is, well, the size of all of these overlapped on top of one another. And it is taking into account everything, all of them. And what's really swish about this is that this means that if I do have something that's slightly off in size, so for example, let's say I scale this on the X axis slightly and then control it A and apply the scale, the bounding box gets a little bit wider. But if I, a totally separate one, scale this on the Y axis and then apply the scale, it takes everything into account. So what that's going to do, as long as none of the tiles are wildly out of size, is it's going to allow that to effectively not be a problem. So I'm going to just undo all of that so we can see that here. And what that's going to do is we can now use this to replace that object info node because we've got our collection bounding box that's going to determine size instead. So what I'm actually going to do is delete that one. And each time this one is going to need to go to our bounding box. So just again to neaten this up, I'm going to shift and P, F2, and put this size of collection. Get rid of that. Move that around there and put that in there. In fact, actually, let's bring that inside of this. So we want size of collection there. We want it here as well. Let's connect that up. And oops, we've got this disconnected. So let's... Put that there so now this is working perfectly fine but using the size of the whole collection so at this point we can start putting in place our group input so that we can control everything over here so what do we want to control well we probably need to control the offset which is this value here so let's put a group input node there and then put that value into that so we've got that value that allows us to control distance between the tiles Let's go to group and I'm going to change the name of that from value to tile gap. So we've got that there. We want a minimum of zero and I'm going to leave that default as 0.8. So we've now got that working and I can control the size of my tile gap. Then we want our counts both on the X direction and on the Y direction. So let's deal with the X first. So that's going to be this mesh line count. So let's drag that out and put a group input there. We're going to rename that from count to width and we've got this as an integer automatically so now i can say i want more tiles as the width i might actually just put in brackets x so it doesn't cause confusion and then we want the same thing where's our mesh line in the other one on our y so let's do that there group input again we're going to change that from count to be in fact thinking about it this one should be width this one let's call length we'll call this one width that's in the y so now we can control how long this is in the y i mean to me this is really cool that this automatically works love this so we've got a few other things to control let's control the rotation of our tiles so what we've got here because well that might not be exactly what we want so we've got our instancing here where we're controlling the rotation so Let's just move this around slightly to give us a little bit more room. And because this is a vector, we're going to need a combine X, Y, and Z as a vector just there. And we want to control this on the X. So we'll put that and we'll do a input node there. So we can rotate that round. So that works perfectly fine there. So we've got that. Let's rename that from width to tile angle. 
So that now works. And then finally, I probably want to be able to sort out the angle of the roof fairly quickly. And that looks a bit rubbish. Let's just up that a little bit more. So there. So I want to control the angle of this roof. To be honest, I'm probably going to do that by hand anyway. So I can just R and X. Do I want to have that as its own value? Not sure. I'm probably going to leave that for now, just because I don't think that needs to be there. But we could add that in there if we wanted. And now at this point, it's working. We can put in our collection. We put in the tile gap. We put in the number of tiles on the X. We put in the number of tiles on the Y. And we can change the angle. Brilliant. Oh, I just realized we haven't done one. Sorry, we need to make sure that this offset of the other one is half that width. Oh, nearly a nightmare. So where's our modulo value here? So we've got our offset there, which we haven't actually set up as something. So let's move that up. And then again, we're going to have our offset as a combine X, Y, and Z. We want to change the X to be effectively that. So Shift and D. And we want this to be controlled by half the width on our X. So let's divide that by two, put that into our X there. So now that's exactly half. Well, actually, it should be half plus that gap because otherwise if we make the gap really big it only goes one way so let's add that gap in and we can just group input there and i want that to be the tile gap there we go and now what's nice about this is that the tile gap will affect that as well cool can't believe i nearly forgot that that would have been a uh, not disastrous but it just wouldn't have been as nice so there we go a little complex but it works really nicely and actually every individual bit makes sense. The final thing that we do want to be able to do is we want to make sure that when we do this, it actually creates a final product that is going to be one object. So I'm just going to shift A and we need to firstly realize these instances. So that needs to go there. Otherwise, this doesn't work. Ooh, this isn't looking very nice because one of these must not be set to shade flat. Don't know how that happened. And then we need to make sure that this actually combines everything together. So booleans it together. So we're just going to use a boolean. So a mesh boolean here. We want to change that to union. Drag that in. And now this is going to create one object. So there we go. We can still modify everything. And until we select apply, we can do that. Now you will notice this is going to slow everything down, this mesh boolean. It's not fantastic for speed because every time it's having to work out, well, everything. So uh, you might not want this in there. You might just want to add that in a later date because it does lead to some problems. Let's put that as 0.8. So you'll notice it does slow everything slightly. But there is a way around that. If I just come over here and set it so that it only does this sometimes. So what we can do is add in a switch there. So at this point, all we need to do is let's put that switch up there. So we want if our switch is false, then we're going to do this. Without it being Booleaned, if the switch is true, then we do the Boolean. So at this point now, because we're not doing the Boolean at the moment, the switch isn't on. I can change this really quickly, so 1.2, and it does it instantly because it's not having to Boolean everything. You'll notice if I then collect the switch and then put in 0 0.8, it takes time to do it. So this switch is giving us that power to allow this to work really quickly. Again, if I've got the switch off and I up that by one, if I connect the switch and then up it by another one, it's slow. So this switch is going to control the speed on if this works, because if it's going to Boolean or not. So what we need to do is we need to have something to turn this switch on and off. So let's do a compare node from maths. And all I'm going to do is say if it is equal to one, I'll put that as zero. So now we're saying we're going to have a value here. If it equals one, then turn the switch on and use the Boolean. If it's not one, then don't. So we're going to do an input. It's called A. Let's rename that and say Boolean question mark. And then all we want to do is set this to be instead of a float, we'll make this an integer. And we'll have a default of zero and minimum of zero and a maximum of one. So effectively, we can either have it as one or zero, put that into the result. So now it is not Booleaned. If I turn that to one, it is Booleaned. 
if it's zero, it's not booleaned. So this switch is going to allow us to effectively make it work faster without having the booleans. And there we go. That is our roof. Let's decrease that in width a little bit. So I'm going to put that to something like 10. That's uh, called 15. So something like that. So that would be our roof with our tiles. And if the tiles change size, so let's just grab all of those, S and Control and A and apply the scale, everything scales down nicely. It's not caused any errors because it's all based off of the size of our tiles. So there we go. That's just R and X and rotate that round to be somewhere there. And that switch node is going to be really important if we just come over here and if from here I bring in my other set of tiles. Now, don't get me wrong, I appreciate these aren't perfectly sculpted tiles. I did these really quickly, but you'll see here that actually this has got quite a lot of geometry to it. So I'm sort of trying to demonstrate the point that this will work because we don't have that Boolean that I can just change this to tile set two. And oh look, there's my tiles and I can really quickly move those around to make them have a big gap, a smaller gap, add on tiles add tiles in the y direction i mean yeah really happy with geometry nodes they're offering a lot of potential fun so let's just bring that up so you can see that really clearly so this is as big as i can make my screen the whole point of this is that you can do things yourself so let me just get rid of that end panel and obviously you can screenshot this as you choose so you can use this in the future so just to end with as I said earlier, please do subscribe to the channel and give it a like if you found this interesting. It helps the channel spread and, and do feel free to comment in the comment section if there's something that I've done in a way that maybe you think there's a better way to do it. I mean, I'm learning geometry nodes very much as I go here. I haven't been doing them that long, but I think this really does demonstrate how useful they can be in terms of making a setup that you're going to use time and time again, even if you're not going to use them on a day-to-day -day basis. Finally, I want to thank a channel called Default Cube. I have mentioned them before, but honestly, I've learned so much watching his channel. It has been really, really helpful in coming up with things like this and giving some ideas of what you can do. Please do check him out as well, and most importantly, have a great day.